Welcome to the Productivity Tips Seminar. In this session, I'll cover the tips for command and control, which includes your work environment and preference settings. 2D and 3D editing tips, hidden chief architect gems, and client sharing, and then finally, using saved plan views. Let's begin with tips and best practices for command and control. With your work environment, be sure your video drivers are up to date. A lot of times the video card companies will update these monthly or quarterly. As a result, they make changes and updates to improve the way those cards work and minimize issues you may find with 3D rendering or even sometimes in the 2D dialog box previews. Underneath your preferences, if you come down to the video card status, you can see where your driver date is updated and then depending on your video card, maybe NVIDIA or AMD, you can use their utility to go out and download and update those video drivers. If you're using a Mac computer, just be sure to do updates on your system when Apple prompts you for those. The video card updates are part of the operating system updates. My next suggestion is to always use at least two monitors. I use two large monitors and my laptop monitor, it gives me three monitors. A space mouse for 3D navigation. I've seen some of the customers out there really impressively use that in addition to their regular mouse to navigate in 3D. If you're a Mac user, having access to a three button mouse can be beneficial. It avoids the need to use additional keys if you're using a trackpad or a magic mouse. It's not necessary. I'll show you more about how this works in the 2D and 3D editing tips. Be sure to customize your hotkeys. I use at least these items right here for snaps, temporary dimensions, and point-to-point -point move. The way you customize your hotkeys is underneath the tools menu, come down to toolbars and hotkeys, and then customize your hotkeys. There's an entire list of the tools in the program. If you find yourself doing something all the time, you can set up a hotkey, which is just a letter on your keyboard or a combination of letters. One of the ones that I use all the time is for temporary dimensions. You can see that I have the letter T assigned to that. To assign a hotkey into it, just come down here, type in the key or the sequence, hit assign. If you're assigning it over an existing system preference, that's okay. The program may notify you. I use object snaps, temporary dimensions, and then the point to point move all the time in my work. Again, anytime you find yourself using a tool more than a few times, this can be a way to improve your work environment. Related to that is to customize your toolbars. It's in the same area underneath the tools menu, toolbars and hotkeys. Come down here, customize your toolbars. This will give you access to the different toolbars. Notice that there is a by view type, so you can modify all different view types. In my plan view on the right hand side, I have the marquee selection tool. And again, you can type in the abbreviation or scroll down to it. The way you modify your toolbars, find the tool. There's actually sub tools underneath here. If I grab the parent tool, pull it over here, it will be added to that in the view type of plan view. If I want to pull that off, simply pull it off. I've removed some of the tools that I don't use very often on my toolbar, maybe undo zoom if I don't want it on there. I can just simply pull it on. That way my toolbar is decluttered and only using the tools that are useful to me. You can also customize and add library items. So if you had a full height cabinet with a double oven and warming drawer, you can go up here and add that onto your toolbar as well. So customize your toolbars to make common tools you use or common library objects you use accessible and useful for your work environment. One of the bigger productivity things is to make sure you're using customized templates that are customized to the way you produce your plans and the layouts. We have a specific video on that that you can access. Each time you finish a job, I usually update my templates based on that job for both the plan and the templates. You can access that underneath your preferences. You can see what you're using. If you come down for new plans, you can see that I have a couple of templates. If you haven't done this, this will just have the default chief architect ones. And they're okay, 
but they're not the way you work. And I would encourage you to watch this very short video to customize that. Take advantage when you complete your most current plan. Do a save as template. It's in your menu system underneath templates. And then you can come in here and save as a template. And then the program will prompt you where you can save that. You can do the exact same thing for your layout. The next thing is maybe obvious, just use good file management practices and then clean out your archives. If you don't know about your archives, they can add up, bulk up your disk space. At the end of the project, you can go in and clean those out. Underneath your preferences again, you'll see a folder. And in my case, for my data folder, I have it located. It's typically underneath the version number. And then, and then under the file management, you can see for the auto archive warning, the default number is set to 14 files. The program is set to backup, in my case, every five minutes to do a backup on my file. And then it stores it in the archive, which can be helpful if you've lost power or for some reason you need to go back and collect the file. You can go into there. And if I just pull this up so you can see where this archive is underneath the folders, we should be able to just hit the browse button here. And the top result here is the archives. If I double click on that, you can see all of the different archives that I've been working on. And then e within each one of these folders are a number of files. You may need to open, if I double click on this, you see nothing in here because it's looking at the folder level. If I open up a separate explore window into that folder, you can see the archives and backups are located in here. And at some point, if you get a lot of these, it's good to just clean up your disk space. You can delete these. And so the program is set to prompt you inside of this warning system underneath file management to one auto save it every five minutes and then the other one is to maybe give you an, an archive warning more of a prompt that says when you reach a maximum of 14 files in this case that it will pop up and say hey you've got a lot of files in there you may want to take a look at it while we're in the preferences Let's take a look at three distinct settings that you can consider that may improve your productivity. The first one is to turn off contextual menus. It makes using Chief a lot faster, according to one of our prominent testers here, Brian Beck. And that setting is underneath your appearance. It's the top setting here, contextual menus. When you click on something, I'll show you this when we close the preference dialog. It will show you what the tool is. You can always right click and it just makes it a little easier to get through it. The next one is to open dialogs to the last panel. You'll find that setting underneath the general panel open dialogs to the last panel visited. In this case, I'm in the preference dialog. These are all panels. When I close this dialog, it will reopen it to the last visited panel, which would be on the general panel in this particular situation. And that can be helpful so you're not navigating around to different panels that may not be relevant. So there's where you can find this particular setting. And the last one in the list is to show start and end indicators. If I kind of slide this around a little bit, I've got an example of where a line and a wall have the start and end indicators. If you're trying to figure out where you're going to resize something about the start or the end, you may not know what it is unless these indicators S and E. You'll find that setting in your preferences underneath the edit panel, show start and end indicators. Again, just helpful to know which area you're going to be relocking or moving, and it will show you the S and E. Anytime you make changes to your preferences, those are a global setting. They're not plan specific. It will affect all of your plans when you're opening them. So preferences are global. So make changes to your preferences to help make your work environment as productive as you can. In part two for the productivity tips, I want to talk about 2D and 3D editing. I'd mentioned earlier about using a space mouse for navigation in 3D and then also using right click and turning off contextual menus. When I use the right click and the contextual menus are on, this is a great way for brand new users to see all of the edits that can be done when this object is selected. These same tools are available in the very bottom of the edit menu. When you get used to what these tools are and you know about them, you can then turn off contextual menus and immediately use the right click to select the object. So I go back into the preferences 
and I turn off contextual menus, then when I right click, the object is immediately selected. Let's talk about using the middle mouse button. If you're a Mac user and you don't have a three button mouse, it's okay. You can use things like the magic mouse or even the trackpad. You will have to press a few other keys to do that. If I scroll back up and you look at the shortcut mouse pad that we have, you can see what these keys are. If I zoom in, and one of the things we're going to be doing here in a minute is orbiting in 3D, you can see on the Mac you will need to press another key on the keyboard and then you can use the magic mouse or the trackpad and remember underneath your tools and hotkeys you can get a list of the hotkeys. In fact you can create your own hotkey list here which you could also print if you don't have one of the mouse pads. So let's take a look at what we can do with the middle mouse button on a PC and then again I'll kind of mention a couple things on the Mac. For precise movement, you can click and drag on an object from any point and onto a snap. In this example, if I use the middle mouse button and hold down on this corner, I can then pull that over and snap that into another area by using the middle mouse button, pressing it down, and moving it to the position that I want. One of the nice things about the middle mouse button is it allows you to pan. In 2D, I'm just holding the middle mouse button down and panning. On a Mac, just simply press the Option key as you click, and that will also give you a pan mode. In a 3D view, let me go ahead and generate a camera here. Typically, when you generate a camera, you're automatically in orbit mode. You can see that my little cursor is in orbit as I kind of move it so you can see it over the top of the camera. I can continue to pan by holding the middle mouse button down, pan around. Then if I press the space bar and I'm out of orbit mode, I can press the Alt key down and get into orbit mode. This becomes a very handy tool. Let's say, for example, I want to paint the window casing on the other side of that window. I'll select the material eyedropper, click on the dark color of the casing, and now that my cursor's in the spray paint mode and I want to paint the object on the other side of the wall, I'll hold the Alt key down, middle mouse button, and I'll rotate around, maybe zoom out a little bit, and now you see my cursor's still in the paint mode. It allows me to paint. Again, press the Alt key, middle mouse button, and I'm still in that paint mode. This is a nice way where you don't have to change your camera perspective, whether you're copying objects, painting objects. It allows you to put you in this alternate orbit mode by pressing the Alt key and the middle mouse button. Let's move back into our floor plan view. As I move past the middle mouse button, door swing and using the mouse drag to control swing and hinge. If the door tool, when you come over and you're hovering over a wall and before you click in place, it will either swing in or swing out. If you press your left mouse button down and then slide up and down, it will also control which side it's going to swing from. That allows you to quickly place the door in an orientation without clicking on the door, placing it, and then coming down into the edit toolbar and changing the hinge or the opening side of that door. Some additional editing tools with the right click alt edit behavior on a Mac it's the alt left click. When you want to drag continuously in wall mode or CAD mode this is a way that is a speedy way of doing it. If I kind of just slide over here a little bit and I go into wall mode and if I right click and drag I'm now in continuous wall mode. That just means that I can come down left click, come down left click, come down left click, left click, press the space bar, and I'm out of that mode. Works the same way if I'm in a CAD line tool. Right click and drag, and then click, click, click. It's the same way. Press the space bar to get out of it. That's called the continuous draw mode, and it's a very effective way if you're drawing some walls or CAD lines out. With the right click or the alt edit behavior, you can make arcs out of items like walls, CAD stairs, and terrain objects, anything that's line based object. When I draw a line out here, let's say it's already drawn, when I hold my Alt key down and click with the left mouse button, you can see that I can curve that line. I'll hit Escape. 
Same is true, let's go ahead and draw a wall and a set of stairs out. The same is true with these objects. Click on it, hold the Alt key down, and you can curve it. With a little more precision, you can also hold the Control key down and get very precise in the movement. Again, with the Wall tool, hold the Alt key down, you can curve it. Duplicate that with the control key and you get very precise movements. That way you don't have to use a specific curved stair, arc tool, or arced wall to draw those particular objects. When you're using a particular tool, you can right click so you don't have to change tools. Here's a good example of that. Let's say I'm in cabinet mode and all of a sudden I decide I need to be out of cabinet mode and I want to select the polyline that's right next to it. I'll just move over the polyline, hold the right mouse button down, click and select it, and it removes me out of the cabinet mode and allows me to select the object. Another great reason to possibly turn off the contextual menus. Another nice tip is polar movement on allowed angles. This polyline that I currently have selected, if I left click and I'm moving this around, I'll turn off my snaps, I can move it up and down and I can't move it in a polar way very easily. So I'll press the escape key. If I hold the right mouse button down and click, I can now move that around pretty easily in all directions. And that's just another way where right click allows me to do a polar movement along angles. Draw stairs down. A lot of times if you're drawing your stairs and you click and drag to drag stairs, they always go up. If you hold your Alt key down, you can click to drag them down as well. Also your right key, your right mouse button, click and drag, those are drag those stairs downward. If for some reason you're going to be drawing those stairs in a reverse order, that's a nice way that you can do it. Point to point dimensions that pick up objects along the length. Let's go ahead and slide over here a little bit and take a look at where this kitchen island is. Typically your point-to-point -point dimensions are going to go from one point to another. So if we just click and drag, it's going to go from one point to another. If I hold my right mouse button down and I click and drag, you see how it's picking up each one of those cabinets along the way? So it will go along and pick those items up. So just another behavior with those dimensions. The next thing is, as we kind of look at our list of items here, rotate freely along angle snaps. I kind of already covered this, rotate freely and ignore angle snaps. If I hold the right mouse button down and I move this object, you can see how it rotates freely. Hit escape. Corner edit handle resize while locking adjacent lines. Let's go up and take a look if I want to resize one of these cabinets. If I click on this cabinet and I hold the right mouse button down and resize it, you see how it's locking the corner of this by moving it. Again, you can also hold the Alt key down and left click to move that cabinet as well. So another option in editing your objects. Drag cameras out to use an alternative rendering technique like vector view. Most of the time when you click and you drag a camera, it's going to generate a standard view. So the standard view is my default camera. If I use the right mouse button and click, you notice the V on the camera in here, and then when I release, it's going to be the vector view style camera. You can define what that camera is in your default settings. If I come over here into the default settings for the camera styles, and we look at the full camera, you can see the alternate rendering technique is specified. You can choose whichever one you want and then either the alt or the right click will control how that camera is generated for you. So slide back over and let's continue down the list here. One of the tools that I probably use the most is holding the control key down to override bumping and snapping. On the Mac it's the command key. If I'm going to be moving something in here and I want to move this freely, just hold the control key down. You get very precise movement and it allows you to override temporarily bumping and snapping without going into your edit preferences and making that change. A few tools down here, the center tool, copy reflect, center between two objects. 
I end up using these tools quite a bit. If I want to center, let's say, this wall cabinet, let's slide him over a little bit. Let's say I want to center this wall cabinet in between the casing, the interior casing, and the finish wall over here. Delete that cabinet for the time being. And I want it exactly centered. There is a center between two objects. If I click on the wall cabinet, use the center tool. So I'll begin with the center tool. Then if you notice there's one more tool in the far left hand corner that is a point to point center. So with the point to point center I'm going to pick up a snap on the interior casing, slide over, pick up a snap on the wall finish. Then the program is going to give me a couple of different options. You see the projection point I'll go ahead and click on the projection point and now I know that wall cabinet is centered on the wall space itself. So that's using the point to point center tool. Most of you already know about the copy reflect tool. I end up using this quite a bit. If I want this wall cabinet exactly copied and reflected around an object, use the copy reflect about object, pick up the window in that case, and now I know that wall cabinet is exactly the same distance around that window. And then using the center tool, use the center, pick up the center of the window, and those center, reflect about, point to point center, invaluable tools to save yourself quite a bit of time. The next item to talk about is being able to shift select stairs and make a change for one specific segment. If you ever have a need to change the railing style on one of the segments, maybe turn it off instead of it turning it off for all stair segments, you can shift click on that stair segment. If we kind of scroll over here, if I hold this shift key down, it will select just the one segment, allow me to open it up, make a change to the railing in this case. If I come down to the railings, and I turn it off on the right, you can see that the railing's off in the plan view and then in the 3D view, same thing. So that's holding the shift key down while selecting the stair segment will allow you to get the selection of just that stair segment. Array copy can be an invaluable tool once you understand how the array copy works. I have a ex simple example over here. It works for electrical plans. It works for making any symmetry with anything you may want to have for symmetry. If I just slide over here and let's use an electrical light over here. And I've, let's say I've clicked and placed a light and I want to fill a room with electrical objects. Go ahead and click on it. Use the multiple copy tool in the lower edit menu. And then let's go ahead and load the values in here. For the multiple copy, let's go ahead and set this to be 36 inches in the primary offset. And let's also go ahead and use 36 inches in the secondary one. Then to initiate the multiple copy in this array, I'm going to hold my right mouse button down, kind of move over the electrical symbol. You see where my cursor changes. And then I go ahead and right click. And when I end, right click and drag, it stops, then I just pull the mouse down, and then left click, it completes the array copy. Works for CAD objects, works for really any object that you can use a copy. Just set the primary and secondary offset for that array copy to take place. Let's take a look at a few edit mode shortcuts. C, when you're editing, stands for concentric. X for resizing text and CAD boxes, and then F for filleting. Let's go ahead and slide back over and take a look. I've got an example of a polyline that represents maybe a lot line. If you want to resize this concentrically, you can use the letter C and easily left click and resize this. I'm hit escape. The letter X also works on that resizing. Hit escape. And one of the things that I like to do in this case, this use case might be the scenario where you need a setback that's inside of the lot line is make a copy of this and then concentrically resize it into the 15 feet or so, whatever your setback is. Using the copy tool, I'll make a copy of this and paste and hold that into place. So it made an exact copy of it over the top. And now when I come over, press the letter C on the keyboard, I'm sliding it in. And as I'm sliding it in, I might press the tab key. This is not 
a large lot. So we'll go ahead and set this at 10 inches and minus 10. I now have a concentric resize that might represent the setback for this particular lot. The letter X will allow you to make something bigger or smaller in this image of the lot. I can press the letter X down and resize this and left click to resize it. So that's the letter X. That also works on text boxes if you want to resize text. And then the last edit tool that I was going to show is the fillet. You can press, let's go ahead and select this. And I'm going to hold the F down for fillet and left click. You can see that will fillet an object. So a few little shortcuts down there with the edit modes, C, X, and F. Let's take a look at part three of productivity tips and what I call the hidden gems in Chief Architect. Math and Dialogues, Tab to Move a Precise Amount, and Temporary Dimensions. Let's slide up into the Kitchen Island area in this plan and take a look at a few of these things. The first one is Math and Dialogues. If I tap on the Kitchen Counter and I want to change the overhang amount, I can come in here, I can type in the value. Math in Dialogues allows you to do things like minus three inches to make the adjustment. If it happens to be fractional inches, you can use that either as a fraction or a decimal. The other one is using the tab to draw a precise amount. As I drag out this countertop, and before I let go of the left mouse button, I press the tab key. This will bring up the Enter Coordinates dialog. And at this point, since I'm dragging down toward the bottom of the screen and I'm in a non-polar mode, I put in minus three inches, we'll be right back at the 12 inches. As I'm dragging this out and press the tab key, let's say it's in a polar amount, this would allow you to just put in a distance regardless of the direction and then adjust the angle. I pulled it directly at a 90 degree angle and then make the adjustment that way. The tab also works as you're drawing out walls and CAD lines. As I draw out a CAD line, press the tab key, you can enter in a precise amount. You can also use math in the dialog. So if you wanted to add something up, then that will make that line exactly 25 inches. Important when you're doing that is you're doing the left click. You press the tab key before you release. Let's look at the temporary dimensions controlling the location and the style. I began the seminar talking about hotkeys. If I press the letter T on the keyboard, you see them go on and off. That tool is also off to the right hand side of my menu. You see the temporary dimension. It does the same thing. The hotkey saves me a step in going over there. Sometimes when I'm zooming in, those temporary dimensions get in my way. Even though I'm using another tool, I can use that hotkey and toggle those off. My dimensions are being displayed in inches. These are temporary since they're not permanent, meaning if I hit the space bar, you don't see them. So they're a temporary dimension. These are controlled by the style based on your save plan view. Currently, I'm in the kitchen and bath save plan view. And if we take a look at the settings for this in the edit active view, and underneath the default settings, you look at the primary format and I'm using inches. So depending on what dimension default you're in, it will display in that format. If I change this over to the floor plan view and I click on this, this is set up to be in feet and inches, so it looks very different. That's what controls the style. Let me switch that back to kitchen and bath. The other thing that you can do is you can change the way these dimensions are locating items. If I tap on one of these walls, you see the dimension as I zoom in is going from, and I zoom in real close, you can see that it's actually going inside of the wall. The kitchen and bath view is excluding the wall layers, and the stud is being picked up in this case, and then it's going to the stud on the outside wall. So the temporary dimension may not be set in the right mode if I'm doing work in a kitchen and bath design where I want to know interior surface dimensions. You'll find that underneath the default settings, underneath dimensions, and then temporary dimensions. A few changes I would make is to locate the wall surface versus the wall dimension layer, which would be the stud. And then I would also change it, the primary wall side, to both wall sides. 
primary wall side is typically the outer side of your wall. And then a few other options, wall with an opening selected, you could change that to the wall surface, and a few other settings that you can adjust with the temporary dimensions. With those changes in place, when I tap on the wall and I zoom in, you can see that it's now going to the surface and it's going to surface to surface in this case. So the location is controlled through your default settings. The next three tools, assign a library item to a toolbar button, replace from library, and object painter. We started one of the sessions with customizing your toolbars and if you're using a particular library object, and I'm going to use a full height cabinet with a double wall oven and warming drawer, I use that a lot in my designs, I want to assign that to a button and then place it on my toolbar. Let's begin by just right clicking on the toolbar and come in and use Customize Toolbars. I'm going to change it for the view type plan and then I'm going to search for the word library and then I'm going to scroll down. I'm looking for the tool that says Place Library Object. This is going to be a generic tool. I'll need to program it once I put it on the toolbar. I'm going to drag that up, put it on my toolbar for the floor plan view type. Now that that's on my toolbar, I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And the first time I do this, it's going to prompt me for the name. And I'm just going to call this uh, Full Cabinet and Double Oven browse out to the library. This is something I've already added into my user catalog that I've created and we'll just come down and find this object. You can kind of see it down here as we scroll around. Then once I have it selected it gives me a couple of options for the thumbnail and I'll just use one of the automatic options. Now that's on my toolbar. You see my tool actually changed to that double oven. And let's go ahead and click and place this. That's an object I use in a lot of my plans and therefore putting it on my toolbar is a quick way to place a library item. Any library item that you find out there can be added to your toolbar. The next two tools, Replace from Library and Object Painter, let's look at these two in a 3D view. With the object painter, you're going to notice that the molding on the double oven that I just placed is quite a bit different than the wall cabinets, and one of the wall cabinets doesn't have molding. If you want to use the object painter, you can replicate parts of a similar object onto another object. In this case, I'm going to replicate the molding off of the full height double oven cabinet onto the other two cabinets. This only works on like objects. It wouldn't work, for example, to put it onto the window. What I'm going to do is use the eyedropper tool that has the little O on it. It's called the object eyedropper. I'm going to click on the particular object that I'm interested in, the one with the build up molding, and immediately my cursor changes to a spray can and it's loaded every single possible value into the spray can. And if I were to spray it right now, it would dramatically change the wall cabinet in a way I wouldn't want. I want to scope this to only select the molding. So I'm going to go ahead and select the tool that says Select Object Properties. This allows me to come in and scope typically what you're going to have. And if it has all of these selected, you can clear all, select all. And then there's a search at the top. And what I'm after is the molding. And I'm going to select moldings and molding materials. That's now loaded into the sprayer. The scoping that can occur, it can be done on an object, all objects in a room, on a floor, and on a plan. So this works, this scoping works on several of our tools. And when I spray that on the object, it immediately transfers the properties that we like to the other objects. It will save you some time. In this case, that molding has a few different offsets, and I don't have to worry about the tedious exercise of going in and figuring out what all those are. So that's called the object eyedropper. The next tool I want to talk about is replace from library. This works well maybe for furnishings, pendant lights. I use the overhead tool so you're not seeing the pendant lights. Replace from Library allows you to select a particular object. I'll press the T on my keyboard to remove the temporary dimensions. And in the lower edit menu is a Replace from Library icon. It says Replace from Library. The program then prompts me, do you want to replace the selected object or identical objects in the room or floor? 
I'm going to replace both of these chairs in the room. We'll browse out to the library. I'm going to come over into my user catalog and I have a few different stools to choose from. Once I've located that, click OK and then it will swap out those two objects. A nice way to quickly change furnishings, I use it on pendant lights as well. The next feature that is a productivity saver is using style palettes. We have a specific video on this if you want to search it. The concept behind style palettes, as I have this sample open, is you can save a grouping of cabinets, doors, windows, wall covers, floor covering in and create a palette. In this case, I've got half a dozen different options. I can use this option. There's scoping for the room and the plan. Click on the floor here and it will transfer all of those components out of the palette into the scene. You can then save that rendering off and then share it with your clients. So style palettes, again, refer to the video on style palettes you can find on the website to learn how you can use those to transform the look of a room. When you share with your clients, you can share the 3D image like I have on the screen here. You can share it as a 360 image and you can also share it as a 3D viewer model that the client can actually walk through. Let's begin with the export process. You'll find that in the file menu system under export. And the first one is you can export a picture, which is just going to be a flat image. I typically will export as a PNG file. They seem to be a little more efficient. Immediately below that is to export as a 360. I try to position the camera in the middle of the room so as I rotate around the focal point might be in the center of that island that you see behind my dialogue here. That way it allows you, and I'll show you one here in a minute, that allows you to rotate freely around and it's a nice way to do it. You can save that up on your cloud account and then send it to your client. Most of these phones, these smartphones have it built in. You can also embed it on your website. As you can see a couple of examples here on our website chiefarchitect.com 360. Below this is the option to export as a 3D viewer file. And the 3D viewer file is the full model as I kind of look at this example in here. The 3D viewer model allows you to save cameras. It allows you to navigate. It works on a phone. It works on a tablet. You can send it out to your clients and it's a really nice way to have them interact with the model. You can also send it out to your subcontractors. I've used this to send out a framing view to my structural engineer. That way I didn't have to drive down to his office, call him up, email him several clips. And it's just a way that you can experience a model in 3D. This is an app that can be downloaded either from the Apple Store or the Google Store and have fun to experience what you've created for them. The final productivity tip the best for last, save plan views. Save plan views control your layer sets and your defaults. There's an in-depth video if you search the website that will show you exactly how to set up and manage your save plan views. It will also allow you to save it on the floor, zoom into an area, and show a reference display over your floors. Let's zoom into the graphic and take a little bit closer look at what this is. I've got three different views set up for kitchen and bath, floor plan, and the electrical view. On the right hand side are really layer sets and that turns on and off different layers. So as you build your set of construction drawings, the layer sets are controlling what's displayed. The annotations, dimensions, arrows, these defaults that are down here in the bottom section of the graphic are all set to a specific layer when you change the plan view. That means when you draw a note on your electrical plan, the layer of that is text electrical for your notes. And that happens each time you change your save plan view. Let me switch over to a sample plan that I have completed here. In this sample plan, there are a number of save plan views. I have these in my menu system that I can drop down and easily change the different save plan views. These are also in your project browser. You can open up two of these simultaneously and look at both of the plans. If I tile my screen and I'll close the other productivity tips 
This allows me to have the same plan open with a different save plan view. These save plan views to edit all of the defaults if you select the edit active view tool on the select selected defaults you can see all of the default settings and since we're using the kitchen and bath default set they're all kitchen and bath related and the important thing about that is they're on specific layers. So not only when you change the save plan view is it changing your layer set it's changing your selected defaults. If we look at the electrical selected defaults these are also electrical related. That means when you draw text on this as we kind of zoom in and you look at the layer for the text in this area it's on the layer text electrical and that's why the say plan views can be so powerful you're not changing layers every time you add text you zoom into the same area over here that text is not on because it's on the electrical layer and it's turned off because the save plan view is tied to that layer set. That briefly touches on the power of save plan views. I would encourage you to go to the website, search for the video on save plan views and learn about how these work and it should save you a lot of time and help you be more productive. The last thing I want to point out is each time you complete a project, maybe you've added defaults, maybe you've added a new save plan view. I build quite a few in my sample plans, ceilings, uh, heating and ventilation, several of them for my views. And I like to save those in my template. I'm always modifying them slightly. And each time I go in and complete a project, I update my plan template and my layout template. I think we started the session talking about these templates. Save as template, that allows you to go in and leverage the work that you've done in creating your plans. You can build upon each one, improving the efficiency in your plan and your layout, and that way you'll be super productive in your projects with Chief Architect. That ends our session, and thanks for watching. So we're gonna open up for live questions. If you have to leave early here, um, we'll be recording this and sending it out later. So you can take a look at that and slow it down and watch what's important to you. So if you want to ask your question, just raise your hand. You'll find that control in your GoToWebinar panel. Raise your hand, and when we call on you, unmute your microphone. Uh, tell us who you are and where you're calling from, and we'll see if we can answer your question. With that, Carrie, we have questions out there. We do, Scott. We have a first question from Charles Labrie. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey Scott, could you go over the uh, shared 3D views again, how to do the cross sections in 3D? Okay, like a, uh, a 3D cross section? Yeah. Okay, uh, sure. You, you went over it briefly, but um, I didn't catch it. I couldn't make notes fast enough. Okay, sure. Let's see if I make sure that, let me find a file here that we can get. Yeah. Let's you mentioned just... using this to send to your engineer. So oh, the, the 3D view, yeah, the 3D viewer file? Yeah. Okay, sure. So um, when you are in a 3D view, let's just open up a sample plan here. And uh, so we've got a, a sample open. I'm in a 3D view. Okay. In your menu system is a export option to the 3D viewer. So I'll pause there for a second. Okay. Okay, so when you then um, select that, it's gonna prompt you to uh, to log in. And let me see if I can just log in over here. I don't want you to steal all my secrets, so I'm gonna put it on the other screen. And so um, this is going to prompt me to either create a new model or replacing an existing remodel. And so then once you go through this process, and I'm going to cancel that out because it'll take a while, um, that's going to put it up on your cloud account. And um, when it's on your cloud account, um, you can then share it. Let me just open that up so you can see it. When you say my cloud account, like, for instance, OneDrive? 
that type of no, thing? No, this is going to be, uh, I've got a couple monitors here. Let me just open up a, uh, a screen here. Uh, here we go. So I've opened up a example here. This is on your Chief Architect Cloud account. Okay. So as a customer, you have access to this is where you manage your licenses. And so one of the options in there is your 3D viewer files. Okay. And uh, so you'll get access to the model you just would have exported. And when you come in here, you can then make it public and then there's a share option once it's public. And when you hit the share option, you can then send an email to your customer. Let's see if I have that next screen here. Yeah, that's not it. And then you can send it to the customer. It has information on how to uh, download the app and how to how to view it. And if you pop over to the uh, to the website here, let's open up the 3D viewer file. It kind of has the information on how that works, Charles. Okay. And how to share them and a little video on how it works. And it's a great way to, uh, you know, immerse the client. They can actually walk through it and get a sense of how that's going to look. There's augmented reality in there as well. And it's called the 3D Viewer. It runs on, uh, you know, Apple and Android. So okay. it's, a, it's a nice way to be able to do that. So do, do they require, is it required to have the 3D viewer also for uh, when you're just sending over like 360? So uh, the 360 is uh, slightly different. The 360 is just a stationary image and it just allows you to um, interact with the, uh, let's just go over here and type in the website, allows you to act over um, with a, image so you can kind of interact with it in a 360. So it's just a solid image. This is actually six images stitched together. Okay. So I can't actually move forward. I couldn't move into the bedroom in this case. So it's just a static image made up of six different panels stitched together. And so that is a difference between the 3D viewer, which I could actually walk into that bedroom and look at it a little bit differently. So these are uh, can be put up on your chief account cloud. You can share them with your customers. Once you export them, it's in the export menu. So once you get your scene set up, then export 360 image. You can go on to the, uh, your cloud account for 360 images for the chief cloud and share it. And uh, it's pretty easy then to even text that to the client. The phones nowadays have this built-in 360 viewer. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right, Scott, our next question is from Paul. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Scott, how are you? Hi, Paul. Um, I have a quick question just about these um, the uh, layout forms. A lot of times I'm doing it at the 22 by 30, 36. Okay. And then a lot of building departments are asking for 1117. Yeah. Are there, is there an easy way to switch the layout as opposed to dragging everything into it by itself? Yeah, so um, I hear that quite a bit. Let me, uh, let me just kind of scroll over and get an example of one of the things that I might typically do. And see if I can pull one up here. So if I open up uh, an example here of one of the houses that I have, yep. and you zoom in to my title block, you see that I put right in my title block that it's at scale at 24 by 36? Yes. Okay, so what I personally do is I save my sheets out as a PDF file, okay? Mm -hmm at 24 by 36. Then when I want to print it or even resave it, I'll print it at the you know 11 by 17. It okay. won't be at scale because it's on the title block that says, hey, there's a scale disclaimer here. Okay. Right. 
So that's what I do. Now, if you actually wanted it at scale at both, you know, a larger view and a smaller view, then you would actually have to have two separate sets of layout files. That's how I've yeah. been doing it. Yeah, and um, if, you, if you have to do it, you have to do it. I have just found this way works well for my needs. Okay. All right, well, that answers my question. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, thanks, Paul. All right, Scott, our next question is from Victor. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, let's check in with Russell. Hi, Russell, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, uh, Russ out in Massachusetts here. And that last uh, 3D overview, when you answered that gentleman's question about scaling in a 24 by 36, I noticed what appeared to be story pole dimensions in that 3D view. Okay. Okay. You How did you do that? that? <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I was afraid you might notice that, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's a feature that we're going to be introducing in the next version. And that's a uh, that's a that's a sample plan that we've been working on. So that that version is uh, due out, you know, first half of this year, and that's one of the features is 3D dimensions. Mm, okay. Here's another example of it. Here, um, I've got a uh, an interior scene set up with the uh, with the dimensions as well. Yeah. 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 So and that's uh, all coming out later yeah so that'll be uh first half of the year and uh it it'll be uh hopefully a pretty fun feature that we'll be able to announce later in the year i was yeah. I wasn't really intending on showing that but there there you go there's a bonus for you yeah thank you i for the last couple of years i have been uh working with clients and i i send them instructions on how to go to your website and download the free 3d viewer the desktop viewer app yeah and what what works out well is i can send an email with the plan file attached oh okay yeah and and they love it because they they can see the plan view and then they have the camera tools and I tell every one of them, as you said a minute ago, don't try it with a scratch pad, get a mouse with a wheel, it works so much better. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work 100% because the video card capacity sometimes isn't there for some of these people's computers. Right. But right. frankly, the, I've done the 3D viewer model where you export it and you, you, know, you send them an invite and the camera tools there just aren't quite as good as they are. Sure. And and just for for everybody else's uh, use, uh, we do have the 3D viewer that runs on phones and tablets. We also have a desktop viewer that you can run on that is accessed on here. So you can actually yep. download that app as well. So that's available for sending them the uh, chief architect plan file. So that's an option as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank thanks you. For, yep. Thanks for us. Scott, we have a question from Otis. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Scott. Otis from Ventura, California. Hey, Otis. Nice video. Yeah. Um, I ha so regarding the uh, the 360 and the, the viewer and so forth, I found it a little bit tough um, sending clients the, um, stuff to look at because they try and look at it on their phone and it's a little hard mm -hmm. to navigate yeah. sometimes and they get frustrated. and but I really like the idea of sending 360 pictures and also using it for my website. When, when you, um, cause you know, there's less that they can get in trouble with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my question is for, if you want to post that stuff on your website, is it simply like, you know, plugging in a JPEG or something on your website? So um, let me just pull this over and open up my account and I'll kind of show you, point you to the right, uh, right area here. Otis. So if I go into my uh, cloud account here and I open up the 360 panoramas okay. and then when I'm on this particular page and 
any of the exports that I put out there, um, you can see that uh, I've actually exported this one down here using the share button or the make public button. And then when you click share, a couple of things you can do. Um, one, you could just take this email link or this URL link and text it to their phone. They can see it. You can email it to them so it kind of generates the uh, boilerplate email. There's also an embed option. Ah. And if you want to give this to your web designer, okay, this will then allow you to embed this right into your website. And so when I go back over to our website on the slash 360 page, that's what all of these different images are. And then when you tap on them, they initially load and then it allows you to then interact with it. So you can uh, use that code to paste it in your website and then you get a, you know, a, a full 360 image. Oh, perfect. So yeah. is that, is that a, a, some kind of a gallery setup with JPEGs on the bottom that, that link to the 360? Yeah, so each one of these are a different image that we happen to have up, right? And so however you want to best implement that on your website, uh, your web guy should be able to take that code that we gave as sample code got it, and then got it. load these up and then you get a little more uh, interactive design rather than just one view that's uh, forward looking in one direction. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right, Scott, just one second. We have... Um, Olu Sola with a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Scott. Hi. Okay. Um, Olu Sola from Toronto. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is actually I'm trying to develop a subdivision, a, mm. a plot with two different houses on it. Okay. Uh, and I'm having difficulty managing that into a file, you know, because for instance, when I do say first floor and the floor to height, a floor to ceiling dimension is different from the other building, everything seems to be going a wire every time. Hmm, I see. How do I, how do I get that done? Sure. Is it important that, um, I mean, are you designing both of these buildings that would be constructed? Yes, together. Oh, yes. Right. Would it, would it work if you design them separately uh, so you don't have the issue of different floor heights and that sort of thing and then use reference to display to show the two in correlation to one another yes that's what i'm that's the solution that i'm engaging right now but yeah. if i want to do everything together and then present it as a 3d model yeah uh, that you can walk through each of the building at the same time then sure. that's what it works yeah, so so there's two approaches. One that you can take today where you're designing both of the models in the exact same plan. Um, and, uh, you know, when you send your views out to the layout, you just have to crop them in so that it's building A and building B. And that will work fine. It's just some tedious work because if the roof lines are different, different pitches and that sort of thing, you just have to change it each time you do the building of it. Um, I've done that before, but I've done it designing building A in its own file and building B in a separate file. And then I use reference display to show the two and how they interact with one another. That might not work for your needs, but are you familiar with how reference display works? Uh, yes, I've used reference display for remodeling. Okay. Uh, so I understand how that works. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking maybe there is a solution for maybe multi-unit uh, subdivision, for instance, and you want to keep all the, like a layout plan, uh, you want to put that together. It's difficult in chief architects. Mm -hmm. So I've often tried to uh, export that to say another program to, to do the uh, site plan. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Brian, are you out there? Do you want to weigh in on uh, maybe a possible solution that uh, Olu could look at? Uh, you know, my 
you know, I think what you've said is kind of probably the best solution in that uh, you're know, using reference plans is the only thing I can really think of to, to kind of give you the best way of doing it. Uh, that's a quick way to get multiple plans onto one, one scene without, uh, without having to design them both in the same model. You know, some of the new features we add in X15 that allow you to move those models around relative to each other also give you some power uh, in terms of setting them up on the on the plot plan. So those might be useful. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. Ooh, okay. maybe another thing that can be done is maybe if we can capture one and then replicate it over the site, maybe it can transfer the uh, information on the site. Uh, right now, even if you have the same kind of buildings and you have four of them on the same plot, it's difficult to uh, work with the four if the level changes are different and place them on the same plot of land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that can be um, that can be a challenge. So what? You know, one of the things in this example I have is I have building A and building B here. Yes. And the plan is only building A, and this is using reference display, so I can superimpose it. And then if I open up, you know, one of these, uh, let's just open up the front overview with an overlay here, if I have one ready to go. Now, some of these are a little bit longer but then you can show it in 3D as well and if we generate let's see if we can open up this front overview well let's just open up a brand new camera here and let's switch on the landscape so that that makes it a little easier, a little more realistic. Ah, there we go. So using reference display with this 3D, yes. it works in the same way. You know how that works then, Olu? Yes, I know how that works. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that's the only way that I've really Done it. I know some people use it in the same, um, you know, in the same plan, but you just have to be able to um, manage different roof pitches, different ceiling heights, and that sort of thing when you're building it. Yes. Yeah. So just a few more moving parts. It's certainly doable. And then cropping out your views when you send it out to your layout sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for calling in. All right, Scott, our next question is from David. Hi, David, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, this is David. Um, I was talking to you just the other day. Um, okay. I wanted to find out um, when you use the painting tool mm -hmm. on your walls. Okay. Is there an easy way to reach, to put them back that they were as they were, or do you have to change them all? Is there a way to go back to the default? Okay, sure. So let's. Uh, boy, I got a lot of stuff open here. Let me just <clears throat> close everything here one more time. There we go. And let's reopen that. So you've um, you've gone through and painted a handful of walls, and now you want to reset them. Is that right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take a look at it. Now that I've uh, cleaned up my uh, workspace here, let me just grab one of those files, and let's peek inside here. David, was that at the NKBA event I talked to you? No, no. Uh, I was no. trying to get this question answered the other morning, and my oh. computer wasn't set up properly. 
I see. Okay, so here we are. We're looking at the uh, top-down <laughs> view, right? And let's say we go in right. and we open up one of our colors from, let's just pick on Benjamin Moore, and we're in component mode, so that's just going to change individual walls, right? So right. we start clicking on these individual walls. Apparently that one's got a break in it. And now we're at the point where we say, oh boy, I've tried so many colors. What was the original color? And you can right. either point and click from this one, or I could tap on this wall. And inside the wall type itself, when I open it up, is that's an interior six wall. I can hit the define button. You can see that it's using drywall in here, right? right. Mm -hmm. And on the materials panel for this, there's an interior and an exterior wall surface and if i click on this use the select tool and you see where there's a use default material ah uh, that's where it is okay. okay and then you see the preview update assuming i got the right side of the wall then it will reset it you can tell i actually already had painted it gray so the original original color of this wall was a, some sort of a beige. Okay. Does How about, work? no, well, the exterior walls. Okay, sure. Same thing. If we kind of just uh, rotate around here. Ah. So um, I had brick. You had brick on there. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just type in brick and let's assume that we uh, had some sort of a brick material in here. Right. And, uh, you know, we spray it on one of these walls. And maybe that wall was originally some seam metal siding. Uh, maybe right. it wasn't, I don't know. And uh, eventually we get to the point where it says, well, gosh, that wall was defined as a particular wall type, how to reset it. And so it's the same dialogue you go into. And in this case, it's the exterior wall surface that I painted. Right. Select material. And then I'll use the same button, use default. Oh, okay. And yeah. so it works exactly the same way. It will reset it to the, you know, original defining wall type. Okay. Does that work? Yes, that works. Okay, Thank great. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for calling in. All right, Scott, our next question is from Carlos. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Hi, Carlos. I'm sorry I was late to the presentation. I try to be on time all the time, and I hope you didn't answer these during the, your presentation. But I wonder if there's any way to go on the defaults and set automatic attic places mm -hmm. uh, without any inside finishes. Because what I've seen, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, any interior walls that I make, they go drywall inside all the way up. Right. And, I have right. to go at the very end and change that. But mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, in the design process, the, the customer changes something. And right. then you end up with a file that is not really automatic. Right. And you have to backtrack a lot. Is there right. any way? Okay, so I've got an attic wall here, right? And uh, after the tray ceiling or whatever this platform is, I've got an interior finish up here. And in reality, since that's in the attic, you're not going to have an interior finish up in this gable, right? Exactly. So what you want is a wall type that's called, you know, walls attic. Um, and what I do typically, and then I'm going to ask Brian to maybe chime in here. My wall types, what I might do is I might just build an attic wall type in here. Let's see if I have one set up. Yeah, I don't see one. What I'm going to end up doing is making a copy of this, and I'm going to call it uh, Seam Metal Siding Attic, and then I'm going to take that drywall and I'm going to delete it. Exactly. That's exactly yeah, what I do. And so that's a that's a step that I had to take, right? And mm -hmm. then you know it's going to it's going to remove that off. Of course, the material that I didn't change the material, but it removes that siding or that sheetrock off of there. And I if I if I understand right, you want to set that up so it happens as a default way underneath your wall. So if you did your attics, um, yes. it would set it up. And I think that would be general wall, attic walls. I don't see where that setting would be. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just pause here for a second and see if Brian has a 
suggestion if it's default way to automatically have attic walls with different layers built? No, I don't think we currently have a way. It's something that's come up, you know, previously we've had some requests to, to control that, but not that I'm aware of currently. Do we have a way to say, take the, you know, interior layers off of the drywall? So uh, it is something we have heard of, you know, quite frequently in the past. So something we can look into, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I, that, I appreciate it. That's the best we can do there, Carlos. No, it, it's a uh, way around it and I appreciate it. It's just that um, I love so much the features that are automatically built that when I get to even to plan stage, uh, if something comes up and they change one measurement, I wish so many things are would be just automatic because yeah. when they work, they're amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I hear what you're saying. Um, I want to be uh, respective of everybody's time here, and um, usually we kind of limit these webinars to an hour. I'm going to do kind of a brief uh, closing here, and then I'm going to I'm going to come back on and we'll do some more live questions. If you do need to take off and uh, get back to your normal day job, then uh, um, thanks for attending. A couple things that we have coming up is uh, actually tomorrow, Friday. We have, if you're a little bit newer to the program or want to brush up on some uh, new skills, we have a boot camp for residential, and you can find this on the website underneath our events. So that's tomorrow morning, and if you want to attend that, these are free seminars. We're going to be doing the same boot camp on kitchens and baths the following Friday. So those are two events we have coming up. And then at the end of the month is the Builder and Kitchen and Bath Show in Las Vegas. We'll be at the show. We've got a number of presentations that are going to be going on. If you're going to the show also, we have a customer breakfast. Again, go to our events page. There's a sign up for that. We are doing an in-person training event that will be following the show. So if you have um, plans to go to Vegas, make sure that you take advantage of that. And then we're going to be doing another webinar like this with live Q&A after the show mid-March. So we'll be looking at camera settings for both your 2D and 3D uh, views. So there's a few different settings in there that we'll be setting that up with. So uh, if you need to take off, uh, again, thanks for attending. And then uh, we'll go back here and answer a few live Q&A questions. I just wanna pull up the website real quick before Carrie gets the, the next uh, question up. This is our events page and those sessions that I was just talking about, here's the builder show information, the schedule that's going to be going on at the builder and kitchen show, the uh, session that will be tomorrow for the residential boot camp, the following Friday residential boot camp. So these are available on our events page and uh, just drop out there and uh, sign up for one of those events. So if you want to stick around and you still have a question, uh, we'll take uh, a little bit more and I'll turn it back over to Carrie for uh, any additional questions we may have out there. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Leanne wrote in and she was wondering if you could review something that you presented earlier. Um, she's wanting you to demonstrate how you placed the sink under the kitchen window and then had cabinets on either side at equal distance. From the oh, okay. The yeah, sure. Thanks. Let's um, let's go back in here. I'm going to close this one up, and let's just open that same productivity tips plan. And yeah, one of the things that uh, I use quite a bit is copy, reflect, and center. And if we just kind of grab these two objects, let's uh, slide them over here. And one of the tools that I like to use is center. You can select the object, in this case, the sink base, use the center tool, center it. The other thing that I used was a point-to-point -point center or a center between two points. As I zoom in, what I showed in the session was being able to center this wall cabinet on the wall space between the finished surface and then the casing. Click on the object, use the center tool, and I'll do this kind of slowly, Hover over the center tool, 
then in the far left hand corner of my screen is a point to point center and then I'm going to click on the casing slide back over click on the finish wall it projects two points and I'm going to go ahead and click right here I now know that the wall space between the casing and the cabinet and the wall space over on this side is exactly the same select this wall cabinet copy reflect around the window over to this side so copy tool reflect about click and that's a reflective copy around and so the wall space would be exactly equal if you were to dimension those out awesome thank you our next question is from carmelo go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question Hello, Scott. This is Carmelo from State of Maryland. Um, the question I have is that I missed the part where you was um, painting the inside window and then you turn around without missing the paintbrush. Yeah. I that part. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So back in the same plan, let's just use our overhead camera view and take a look at this. I got a bunch of stuff going on with it. And so in the uh, in the video, what I did was we took the material and we wanted to paint it. And let's just paint this uh, some other color so we can see this. And let's open up our library so it's easy to do. And let's get rid of our brick material. Let's just find a, a color here. There we go. Okay, so once I get a, uh, a color that I want and I come over here and I paint that on the, on the molding, right? It changes it and I don't wanna have to get out of this paint mode if I wanna turn around and paint something on the other side of that wall. Is, is that kind of what you were after, yes. Carmelo? Yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. so I'm still, in the, I'm still in the paint mode. You see my cursor if it's possible on, on the screen here. It's still in paint mode. So yeah. what I do is I'm gonna hold the Alt key down and then my left mouse button. And what that's gonna do, ah, sorry about that, undo that. So the Alt key down and the middle mouse button, Alt key, middle mouse button, and that allows me to rotate. I'll use my wheel to zoom in and zoom out and I'm still in the paint mode, right? Mm -hmm. And that allows me to paint something. Mm. Now, so again, um, yeah. I see that we got to press the Alt key and then turn around. But uh, uh, if I had the Alt key assigned it to other function, like a hot key, that will not affect? I think if you hold the Alt key down and the middle mouse button, Alt key, middle mouse button, that allows you to stay in that mode and paint. Okay, perfect. And um, if you go into your hotkeys, basically it's orbit in 3D, Alt key, middle mouse button. Okay. Yeah. If um, this video is gonna be online, pretty, pretty sure, right? Yeah, so we'll be uh, we'll be sharing out this session, and uh, so you can watch those things. Where I can find it later on if I want to revise anything else. Uh, where can you find what? What the was video. your question? The video? the video. Yeah, sure. So if we go to the website, let's come over to the website here, and let's just uh, duplicate this. So from the main website. If you come down to the user center and you go down to training videos, oh, okay, okay, good. And then there's a playlist towards the very bottom down here that says recorded live stream videos. Um, last one we did here was terrain and site plans, so you can then come over here and click on that and, and watch it. Does that work? Perfect. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much. You bet. Are you ready Karen? for some more questions, Scott? Yeah, let's take a handful more. Okay, we have Sandra here. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, uh, Sandra from the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, I Hello. Um, when I have uh, my layout view with various uh, plan views, elevations, etc., 
is there a way to uh and let's say i then update my overall plan and you know save it um, which i i tend to do that frequently just as clients make big changes or whatever is there a way to update all those views to the new plan so that I don't have to reformat everything and you know lay it out again? Okay, I want to make sure I understand your your question here, Sandra. So you you've got a uh, you've got a plan and uh, maybe it's at the point where you think it's done and then the the clients come back and and need some changes. Right. You make the so change. Wanna, right. I want to. I want to keep that. You know that current plan. I want to keep that, but I save it as a. You know today's date versus yesterday's date. Mm -hmm. And how do I update that whole layout? You know package with the newer plan. Right. So um, there's a Without few different ways. Select each one individually, which is what I do now. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a few different ways that you can um, do this. Let me. Um, let me just share with you what I do. Uh, it, there's different ways to do it. This is, this is actually what I do. It doesn't mean it's the best way. It just happens to be one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I never change the plan name. In this <laughs> example, I've got two, two, two objects here, the Smith plan and the Smith layout, okay? And I never change those names because then I don't ever have to relink them. Yeah. So so what happens is the Smiths come to me and say, oh, you know, um, we like what you've done, but we need something, something more, something less. Right. Okay. So what I do is I take the plan and the layout file and I have a folder for backup files. Mm, better idea. Yeah. So I take those, and actually what I do is um, I will copy those into my backup folder. Then I will change their names, and I will put a date or a revision yeah. number on them. Yeah, I use dates a lot in my file names. Yeah, yeah so I kind of, I use zip files down here, but um, I used a date associated with it. Then when the Smiths call me back up and say, oh gosh, that change we asked you about, we had no idea it was that much more money. <laughs> exactly. Right? <laughs> then I can reverse out what they did, right? <laughs> and I have access so back, to it. Good, yeah, that's so a way better. Yeah. I actually never change the file name once I kind of select one, the Smith plan, yeah. the Smith layout, that's it. I never change it and I use this backup folder to manage my file management process. Right. Yeah. Got it. Yes. Thanks. Now that doesn't mean this is the best way. It just happens to be the way that, you know, that I use it. Okay. Does that but work? No way to, yeah, that does. That's a way better way to do it. There's no way to group select your layout windows to update it to a different plan. Is that right? Well, I mean, you certainly can. I mean, you can take the, you oh. know, the Smith plan, you can change all the windows if they're, you know, changing brands or some style yeah. Uh, yeah. difference. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to keep two different files and do revision management, you're, you're going to, you know, you could save that as, you know, Rev A, Rev B, and then it may break your link to your layout because you would have sent that out as the original Smith plan there. And now you've saved your other plan as Rev B, so you do need to make sure that you manage all of those respective links and update them. Right. I okay. don't like to work as that hard, so I just use this process. And uh, you know, it works for me. It doesn't mean it works for everybody. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. All right, Scott. Our next question is from Kareem. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, let's check in with Patricia. Hi, Patricia. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. 
Um, hello, can you hear me? Hi, Patricia. Hi, can you hear me? I can, yes. Oh, good. Okay, so I think you answered my question, but I have a plan done and I have a layout and then I have all kinds of elevations and pictures. And if I just go into the backup entire plan, will it back up everything? Yeah. Um, when do you also you, you you have so you have a layout file and a plan file associated with your project? Yes. Yeah. Yes. If you back that up, since you've sent your elevations, maybe a floor plan out to your layout. Yep. If you go in to your layout and you say backup entire plan, it will back up both the layout and the plan file, and they're combined in one. But will it back up all of the elevations and the? Yep. So section? let's let's uh, let me open up a uh, a layout here. I'm, I'm doing one. it as we speak here. <laughs> do I have to do it as an archive zip, or can I just do it as backed up? Uh, you can do it as a zip or not a zip. Let me just grab a layout file here. And uh, yeah, there we go. Takes me a minute. Okay, and let's switch back over, close this up. Okay, so I've got this layout file open, right? And elevation views sent out here. Uh, I've got, you know, different views sent out on here. Yeah. So each one of these uh, views is sent out, including all of the elevation files, right? Yes. Okay. So at this point, I can go into the menu system and say backup entire project. And I'm going to do it from the layout file because it, from the layout file, since it's linked to the plan, right? All these views are really in the plan view and the layout's just basically arranging these in some sensible fashion. So if I go into the file menu and I say backup, in this case it says backup entire layout, it's going to reach out and it's going to back up the plan file and it could be you sent multiple plan files to this, maybe a separate bath project and a separate kitchen project. Any of those files that were sent out to this view will be backed up. Now, if you don't want it to go to a zip archive, you can uncheck the zip archive. And then you're gonna potentially have a lot of files because when this goes in and backs up your plan file, your plan file, any image, if you look at the kitchen in the background here, there's tile, fancy tile on the walls. All of those are referenced files and they're actually not in your plan. They're, they're little images on your disk. And all those images will be separate files and you could end up with hundreds, hundreds of files in one folder, as opposed to a zip that would put it all in one. So that's kind of the difference there. But you're not forced to do the zip file, it's just the convenience of carrying around one file. So this backup process will get your plan, all of the linked reference images like the hardwood and the tile in that view, mm -hmm. and it will store it and back it up for you. And I saw one of the questions that got typed in, I'm working in a multi-computer environment or a multi-user environment, you can then make sure that you've saved that on Dropbox or where it is, wherever you may be making it easy for people to um, share your files and then they will have access to the, you know, the tile and different materials you may have selected because, again, they're not embedded into the plan file. Um, do you think that that plan that you have open right now is on 24 by 36? Well, I know it is. Yeah, I know it is. Um, if you zoom in here, I've put that in my title block. Okay. Is that a file that you shared with us at one time that we could look at how you created all that? Oh, sure. Um, if you go to our samples page on the website, mm -hmm. um, if you look underneath the user center and you go down to samples gallery, um, you can open up the different samples. That was the Silverton plan, which we have separated whole house, the 
bath project and then the kitchen project, which is the one we I think we were just looking at. And okay. so you can download those samples and uh, see how those are those are put together. The layout file is in, included in there. At least I know it is for the uh, for the whole house. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much. That's very yeah. helpful. A lot yeah. of lot of things. We're gonna have to watch this two or three times. <laughs> yeah, there's a <laughs> there's a lot of moving parts to it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, thanks for calling in. All right, bye. Scott, we're gonna check back in with Kareem. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, good day, guys. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Okay. Now we know yes. where the time zone is you're calling in. Welcome. Yes. Thanks. Um, I have a little issue. Uh, I'm trying to use pan save views, um, but I want to separate when I dimension. I want to have the automatic dimension and the manual dimension of different layers. Um, okay. But I'm not figuring out how to get that done. Okay. Sure. Could you help? Uh, well, let's take a look. So let's just do a, a new plan here and uh, just do a simple plan. And let's draw four walls. Okay, so my dimensions show up. These are automatic dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at this, my selected defaults by going into the edit active plan view, my dimensions are going on to floor plan dimensions. Mm -hmm. So what I could do is I could change this layer and let's uh, let's make sure that you wanted, uh, let's just call this, uh, let's make a copy of it and let's call it automatic for lack of a better name. Mm -hmm. And let's change the color. Let's just make sure that it's obvious what we're doing here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are the uh, automatic dimensions, right? And I've got them on auto refresh and it's setting up to do that way, right? Mm -hmm. well, now you want to run a manual dimension, right? Yeah. So what I might do at this point is this is in a save plan view called floor plan. And what I might do, Kareem, is I might, because if I change the layer for my dimensions, it will change it for both. And you want them separated, one manual, yeah. one automatic, right? Yeah. So what I might do is I might build a brand new save plan view that allows me to dimension things in another view. And let's just, instead of going through all the tedious exercise of building one, let's switch over to this one that I already have that's just a different one. And let's go in and just check our dimensions. And that's going to be using a particular dimension default. I'm going to make a copy of this dimension. Uh, let's make a copy of it. And let's call this manual to use your nomenclature. And let's put that on the layer for manual dimensions. Manual, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now when I dimension this, and let's run a dimension through here. So here's a set of dimensions. And if you tap on it, it should be on the layer called manual, right? Mm -hmm. And if we were to open up our say plan views, and the other one was floor plan. Oh, let's tile that. Got a bunch of stuff open here. Okay, so in the floor plan view, You can see that, you know, we've got both, right? Manual and automatic. Mm -hmm. Now you want to see them both on the same? Yes, sir. Okay, well, let's switch over. And again, I'm not going to build a uh, uh, a new layer set, but let's switch over to this working view. 
and let's just turn those two layers on, manual and automatic. And manual, might have to change the color because I probably didn't change it. Right? And, uh, you know, that's layer, a function of layer, so we'd have to change that probably. So there they are. Oh. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that works. Yeah, not very pretty, so we need to change that yeah, maybe. That's, that's okay. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So there's, your, there's your dimensions. One is manual, right? And one is automatic. Yep, that's what I wanted. That's what you're after? Yes, sir. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. All right, have a good evening. All right. Carrie? Yep, our next caller is David. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, uh, let's check in with John Pitcher. Hi, John. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Hi, John. Hey, how are you going? Good. Um, I do uh, interior elevations for my cabinetry. I was wondering if uh, there's a way that we can um, change the opacity of uh, appliances and things like that so that I can show in the elevations things like um, electrical outlets, uh, positioning behind um, ranges and stoves and uh, coffee machines and also I like to put my outlets behind drawers and things like that. So, and um, I, you know, I'm finding that even though I put heights and dimensions and things for my electricians, um, having a, a, a visual plan in, you know, in an outlet, uh, sorry, in, in an elevation form so that I can um, just say, okay, here's, here's what, we're, what we're looking for. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a way that can be done. Well, let's uh, let's see if we can answer your question. Dave, where are you, or John, where are you calling from? I'm in Texas. Okay. You don't sound like you're from Texas. No, I'm a long way from, uh, from a <laughs> long way from Australia. Yeah. So if we open up a wall elevation to see if we can understand your question, right? So I got a sample here. Yep. Um, you know, one way, one simple way you could do it, I'm not sure this uh, meets your need, but you can turn on the glass house view. Yep. And uh, difficult to see, but I've got an outlet here for the microwave. Yep. Um, so, so that's that's an approach that you could use. Could, is, would there be a way of highlight, of changing the color if we were to use something like that? Would it be a way to um, make the outlets, you know, a different color or stand out more? Because obviously, it's it's still uh, hard to see there. Yeah, I'm not sure what kind of outlet that is. Let's let's throw in an outlet for uh, specifically for a refrigerator. That's yeah, you can actually you see that. Down, see yeah, down below. Uh, yeah, let's resize this so we can pull him up. So there's the outlet there. Let's slide it up where maybe you might typically put uh, a refrigerator outlet. So here's our outlet, right? Yep. Um, and and you want to. I mean, one thing you might do, what if you sent out two wall elevations, one that didn't have cabinetry on it and one that only had electrical on it? Would that... In the real world, talking to the subs on site and, um, you know, I have plans with dimensions or over all the time and they don't read them. So I'm also <laughs> built yeah, at the okay. end of the day. So um, okay. I sort of do both. I do the design and the build. So, you know. I've I've had 25 pages of plans on site and they don't read it and then I go back and check all the dimensions and and it just does my head in. So what I'm trying to do is find a uh, at the moment I'm sort of um, just doing a uh, an elevation and taking a lot of the cabinetry out uh, a, a, a view and try and give them, give them those dimensions and things because um, I'm getting down to the specifics of where we want water outlets you know for wall you know um, for specific things like uh, shower rails. Um, you know, sprayers, all those sorts of things. So trying to get specific dimensions when you've got cabinetry and other things around is uh, um, is is very difficult in a plan view. So obviously trying to do it in dimension in uh, in elevations. Right. Well, I mean, if you still want the refrigerator on in this view, right? It's it's order of precedence is in front of that outlet. Yeah. And so, 
I mean, one option is you could draw a CAD box over the top of that. Yeah. You could put fill style in there so that it um, shows up, you know, some some color you said bright, so we make it bright. Well, so yeah. I, I don't do I don't do uh, my elevations in color like you're showing here. I just obviously uh, I'm just doing mine in black and white. Okay. Um, which you know, so I mean, I can I can I've, I've been doing workarounds. I guess my question really was is can I um, can I change the opacity of something like a, a fridge and uh, as a single item like you changed it originally to um, the uh, the grey. Um, yeah. You know, can you do it for a single object? I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, I think the answer there is no. Uh, yeah. You can't just set the refrigerator to be a, a translucent material. Not not yeah. easily. I mean, I could spray it to be glass, and you could see yeah. through it. But that that'd be odd in your 3D views. Um, you know, the I guess the two things I can think of is one, you could draw a cat over the top of it, like I just did here, and you could do a dimension line to this. Yep. And or do a call out with a text object. I didn't do, I just did these, you know, these notes, but you could, you know, copy in a note here. You could add the dimension to it. Um, I don't have any dimensions to electrical in this view, but you could add the dimension. You see how I have an electrical pop up here that I did the call out for. Yep. And then you could dimension those. Yep. And so if it's important to you, you could do that. The only other thing I could recommend is doing an electrical elevation view. And, That's what I'm doing uh, at the moment. Yeah, and that way you don't have to draw a separate CAD over there. You've done your electrical plan, right? And uh, rather than having two of these, we switch over because a lot of times this electrical isn't enough in a floor plan view because it doesn't give you where the elevation is for this refrigerator or wherever else you've got. And so if you built a view for just electrical and an elevation and then you dimension those those aspects and do a note call out for it, that would be the other way I'd recommend. Yeah, okay. So I might just pause there and see if any chief staff have any comments on how how you might handle that. Crickets. Okay, <laughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks, John, for, uh, for calling in. No worries, mate. Thanks very much for your time. All right, Scott, we have Howard here. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, Howard. Let's check in with Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, I'm Yvonne from um, Maryland. And it's kind of a simple question relative to what we've been discussing. But um, I have an addition. And I'm having to um, thermally isolate the uh, addition from the existing house that's padding out the walls. And the addition, of course, is on an exterior wall. Well, the uh, room definition is not picking up this new extra thick wall. My room definition uh, remains the same. I would like to reconfigure the room definition, but I don't see anything like that. So in 3D, you know the flooring is not going underneath any doorways you know mm -hmm. have a passageway through it yeah right okay so um as i understand it you've done a uh, an addition on to the project and the wall type might be different on it and you're not getting room definition that's right so um let's just take this simple little four wall house and let's build a addition to it and you said it, the wall type is different. The um the party wall there, the wall type, uh, this the addition has to be thermally isolated from the existing. So that wall type is to is totally different right there where the where um it shares a wall with the new space. Right yeah. here. Right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've changed that wall type to be some different wall type, right? Well, it's thicker. So just say it's ten inches, you know. Okay, so let's just uh, open this up and let's make a copy of it and we'll call it a uh, 10 inch wall or we'll use a uh, nine and a quarter inch yeah. wall, right? Right. right. Maybe maybe no siding on it because we right. stri stripped it off, right? That's right. And um, then we'll put That's in. 
brick on it, you know, but I'm not yeah. going to switch, switch, um, take the brick off. Yeah. Yeah. So then we'll just put on some uh, drywall. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I have a 10 inch wall and uh, we'll call it six 10 inch wall for lack of a better name. Right. Right. Okay. And so I built this wall and um, I often like to just change the color here real quick. So we know that it's different. We'll set it bright so you can see it. Okay. So here's this 10 inch wall and it's probably maybe aligned so it's even on the inside. Mm -hmm. So something like that. And you have to put a doorway in it. The issue is, well, first you should define the two spaces. Okay. And that way they, you know, they have an existing definition and then you go back and you, you changed it. And, uh, okay. Okay. So we'll just call this uh, room one, mm -hmm. and then we'll call this room two. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So. Okay. So we go to render the flooring. Yeah. And is it going to be in that threshold? Okay. Let's click on the room one um, definition. Okay. So what happens underneath that doorway? What kind of threshold am I? Oh, I'm sorry, this is a door. This should be a doorway. So doors have thresholds. Doorways don't necessarily do have a okay, threshold. Okay, so you want it to be a doorway. Yep. Okay, so you want material underneath that door, right? Yes, underneath that doorway, yep. Well, let's see what we've got here. That looks like it. Well, I'm not getting that. <laughs> Well, if you're not getting room definition, you get no, nothing when you click in this. I'm going to room definition on both sides. Okay. But when I look at it in 3D, I don't get any flooring under the doorway. I don't know why. I thought it was the room definition that needed to be adjusted, but that's just my thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. might not be there. Well, you could send it in. We can take a look at it if you want. Yvonne. All right. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you so yeah. much. Send it into sales at Chief Architect. We'll take a peek at it and see what you've got going on. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for calling in. All Carrie, right. maybe a couple more questions here and then we'll let okay. folks go. We have two more questions in the Perfect. hopper. Our next one is from Michael Hill. Hi, Michael. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Scott. You already uh, mentioned my question that I typed in uh, yesterday, I think, about uh, plan sharing, file sharing. Dropbox is just okay for it, but we end up with, uh, you know, someone doesn't have the same catalogs, so we're constantly chasing down missing files. What's the what's the best practice that you'd recommend for doing that? Sharing files, um, particularly in cataloging catalogs specifically. So, so like bonus like catalogs or manufacturer catalogs you're downloading from Chief Architect? Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, one, one designer will have her own catalog of something and do we all have to buy the same catalog four or five different times for every user so that we don't end up with those missing files without doing a full full exports are okay too we do that yeah yeah full export will get you um are, are you using chief architect premier premier 14 yep yeah it, or it, the latest one whatever okay well for, you, you don't you shouldn't have to buy those catalogs those should be part of your your user account so there shouldn't be a transaction there as far as um the best way to share those if if you guys have a common access to Dropbox you could designate somebody to download those and you can point your catalog files to to that area um, if you go into your preferences here and uh, let's go open up preferences okay and, so we save the catalogs to that yeah folder. right so if you look here I actually have my files under Dropbox, library and reference files. Uh -huh. And then same for your system libraries, Dropbox, right? As long as everybody has access to that, then um, you can take advantage of, you know, those in a common place. Oh, okay. Uh, that's easy. Yeah, uh, and there, there should be a support article that gives you a little more detail on the website if you just if you type in that as a search, you should be able to find information on that, Michael. Okay, super, appreciate it. With, uh, are, are, are there, I mean, you you have it on Dropbox, it's a pretty good 
uh, recommendation right there, I guess. Is, well, are there any other? Because um, I'm like you. Come I... without, it doesn't come without drama, okay? Agreed. Dropbox and and others, right? OneDrive and iCloud, and there, there there is drama associated with it. Sometimes the service isn't great. Sometimes they have synchronization challenges. Um, you know. And, and those are all on our radar, and at some point uh, that's going to get enough traction for us to probably do a version of the Chief Cloud that makes it a little easier. Uh, Dropbox works okay. It's Agreed. not perfect. Agreed. We, we've considered setting up our own server. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard. Yeah. And it needs yeah. constant maintenance and things. Yeah, I, I would give Dropbox a try and uh, see how that goes. I mean, that is certainly on our radar. It won't be, you know, in the immediate future, but it's definitely on our radar because file sharing and uh, uh, library sharing and preference sharing and all those things, you know, we, we recognize file management can be challenging. Um. Okay, I appreciate it. Now, you, you mentioned catalogs being, uh, I, I presume that's as long as the SSA is still good. I We are, we, we have one license on X15 and a, and a couple of licenses on X14, so we don't all have the, the SSA. That's Is that what you're referring to when you say catalogs are no cost? Yeah, I mean, uh, those catalogs should be downloadable. They should be free. Uh, some, some customers attend these sessions using Home Designer and they aren't necessarily free for, for that product line. Um, if you're if you're using a split between X14 and X15, sometimes we rev those catalogs and they will be version specific. So if you downloaded a catalog in that situation and one of them was X15, and your X14 folks wouldn't be able to read that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. the same if you save a plan in X15 and somebody tries to open it in X14 it's not backward compatible. It's the same, right. same challenge. Okay, which we don't do or, okay. Thank yeah. you, Scott. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. Carrie, our last question here. Our last question is from our first question asker, oh. Charles. Okay. Go ahead, Charles. Hey, Scott, quick question for you. Um, you referred to, uh, uh, one of the callers was asking about multiple buildings on the same site. Mm -hmm. And uh, you referred to using the reference display to show them both. Could you go over that briefly? How you yeah, so, so reference display works when you have a, you know, you want to show a floor above and a floor below. And you can right. also point it to an as-built. And let me close a few of these things. Let's see if I have access to that same plan. Yeah. So in this this example that I have, um, I've set up reference display, and you can see it off to the side. This is a separate plan, and using reference display, I can toggle it on and toggle it off. Okay. And if you look at reference display, in this case, by tapping on the floor indicator, right? Um, I've gone out, I've saved the neighborhood house or the neighbor's house in the same folder. I happen to have the footprint floor plan of it. Uh, it was a previous house that had been designed, so I had okay. access to it. And so there's a layer set called footprint. And, um, and so once you set that up, you can use that reference display and you can dimension to it. Maybe there's a setback requirement, right? And you can show it. And then when you take a 3D overview, it's the same process. You click on the floor indicator and then you point to where that file is. And in this case, this is the single file, right, of the project we're working on. And then mm -hmm. reference display works exactly the same way. Tap on the floor indicator, come down, find where the external plan is. I've saved it in the same folder so it's easy. You can change the rendering style, you can change it to standard. And now that will show that in a 3D view. And once that comes up, it takes a minute to open it. You know, here's, here's house one and house two. 
and this only exists from an external file because I use that reference display. So I can't click on it, I can't, you know, move the windows or that sort of thing. You can move this, you know, move this around and adjust the reference display. If you look at the coordinates actually in here, there's an X, Y, and Z offset and you can dimension it. So you can move it and position it exactly using the X, Y, and Z. It will move it in 2D and it will move it in 3D. Okay. So that's reference display. Reference display works to an external file, and it works also with um, a floor above and a floor below, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Thank you, I appreciate your uh, answering on that. That was yeah. good. Yeah, Thank you. you bet. Thanks for calling in, Charles. So uh, close out, thanks everybody for attending today.